All right, go ahead. Hi, this is Eileen McCusick, and this is Your Superior Self. Eileen, thank you so much for taking the time to join. This is truly fantastic that you're here tonight because uh, like we were talking about earlier, I do have some, um, you know, uh, I, I don't know, I'm going to call it weaknesses, but I definitely have some uh, things going on in my body. And what you what you do is, uh, you know, I guess your first book was tuning the human biofield. So I'm pretty excited to have you on the show because I definitely need some advice. Um, so I'm very interested about your story um, because it's you use, I, I don't, I don't even want to try to explain it because I don't like use tuning forks around the body, the energy field, right. To help people uh, get, I guess, uh, release energy that's been stuck there for quite a long time. Is that right? Yeah, I help to get our human instruments in tune, that we are all electrical instruments mm -hmm. and we're all pretty out of tune in different ways because we've taken a lot of hits. Like if anybody's a musician, you know that you pick up an instrument, <clears throat> hasn't been played, it's been bashed around and brought to different climates and stuff that you need to tune it before you play it. Otherwise it's gonna make noise. And we I know definitely make some weird noises. I can tell you that much. My yeah. body. <laughs> and um, we know that our cars, you know, get out of tune. <clears throat> and our human bodies are no different. We, but we've been taught to think of ourselves chemically and mechanically. But mm -hmm. we're also like electric and acoustic. And that's the level that I work on, getting that part of the body into tune. So it's making music and not making noise. And then the physical body just follows. That's awesome. That's very interesting. But before you got into this, like, what were you doing, though? Like, you were doing different things outside of this, right? Well, suffering, mostly. Suffering. <laughs> Who isn't suffering? I mean, geez. Um, yeah. How did you find this stuff? I think it was in the book. Your son came up to you and started talking about plasma, and that, that set off, like, a, um, you know, kind of a signal to you or something like that. Yeah, that was a turning point because there was a lot of suffering up to that point. And, and suffering with, you know, all the stuff that everybody suffers with. I was fat, I was broke, I was in debt, I was sick, I had a short fuse, I was, I was miserable, but I'd actually spent decades trying to not be that, you know, reading all kinds of self-help books and going to all kinds of different therapies and like trying to get unstuck from all that, but just kind of failing and, you know, be myself up because I spent so much time and money and I was still like broke and fat and miserable. And, um, and then, and then there was like this aha kind of turning point. So at the time, this is 2010, I'd been using tuning forks for 15 years and, and just bouncing sound off people and listening to the sound that comes back, kind of like a bat or a dolphin, you know, it's echolocating on people with just single tones. And I discovered that there was this whole sort of tonal landscape sort of hidden in plain view in the atmospheres and in the, in the fields around people's bodies. And after many hours of observation, I discovered that there was like this whole pattern that there was this whole anatomy and physiology and language of waveform that the body emanated that intersected with the overtones and undertones of a, the pure acoustic tone of a tuning fork. And there was a whole language there and so over the years, I've decoded the language and mapped the terrain, discovered this whole anatomy and physiology of the human biofield, of the human electrical system that is both the electric current that runs through us and the magnetic field that surrounds us. And that that's the element, that's the system that determines whether we're alive or dead is our electrical system, right? If we have a heart attack and our heart stops and electric juice stops pumping through our bodies, you jumpstart it with the same electricity that comes mm -hmm. out of the wall. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, you did a lot of research, though. Um, you started learning about quantum physics. Is that right? Like you started going in that, in that. I don't know. Maybe I'm reading it. Maybe I'm getting my books mixed well, up. Well, it was in the in the very beginning. I think I read Deepak Chopra's book, uh, Quantum Something or Other. I can't think of it right now. Quantum Healing. And it, that book introduced me to the idea of, you know, the early quantum scientists in the late, in the early 1900s, Planck and all of those guys basically 
figured out that it's all vibration, that there is no matter, that there is no stuff and that it's absolutely impacted by the observer. Like that was the essence of the birth of quantum physics with this like, oh my God, it's all vibes and we can affect it with our minds. <laughs> like, and, and so that it was that kind of the essence of that that made me realize like, wow, everything really is vibration. The, the illusion of, of matter is an artifact of our own limitations of our nervous system that slowed things down. But really everything is light and, and woven light and, and, and just space, really it's all waves yeah. in space, you know, that it seems like it's something other than it really is. And so then I was like, oh, that means that the human body is basically waves in space. So if I'm just vibration then treating vibration with vibration is really direct, is really efficient and just gets right into the essence of what we really are. And, and that's what attracted me to it. In the first place, it was just logic, really. Hmm. Well, how did you get in the practice of like healing people with their bodies, right? Like you, you had this epiphany about us being vibrations. Like, how did you get into that healing modality? Well, at the time, <clears throat> I started a restaurant when I was 20. And the restaurant went from having 16 seats when we first started. And it was just my two older brothers and me and my mom. And within four years, we had, we had like 150 seats. We tripled the size of the dining room, doubled the size of the kitchen. I've been working like 100 hour weeks on my feet. We had like 32 employees. Like the, this little restaurant just went and it blew up. And I worked so much and I lived on sugar and coffee and my back got ruined and my adrenals got wrecked and I had TMJ like shooting up through my head and I hated people and like I was a wreck it like practically killed me and and all the while that I had been growing this restaurant surrounded by sugar you know and I was a sugar addict so it's like an alcoholic owning a bar you know it was bad it was so torturous um, <laughs> I had been reading books about health and human potential, about science and spirituality. Like first and foremost, I'm really a researcher and I'm really like, I can absorb a lot of information. I read very quickly. I read a lot of different things. So I take in information from a lot of different sources and then I'm pretty good at like synthesizing them and like making them simple for people, which is, you know, what I kind of do in both books is take this a lot of like big ideas, but figure out how to make them digestible. Mm. And so, so I've been doing that, you know, and I really realized that I had an interest in especially natural health and wellness. And I'm, I didn't really want to be in the restaurant business anymore, but I didn't want to go to school for like 12 years. Like I never went to college. So I was like, oh, if I go be a naturopath, like I, go to for like, I don't know how many years and I really don't want to do that. So, um, so I left the restaurant and I went to massage therapy school and in order to like heal my own back and my own issues and stuff like that, you know, and I started doing yoga and I started eating well, and I started really taking good care of myself. Um, then I had to go back to the restaurant cause my mom got a brain tumor and died. And so I kind of had to go back and fill my mom's shoes, but I did this part-time massage practice on the side. And that's where I was reading those, started reading books about vibrational medicine. And then I found a set of tuning forks and I started having people that I was comfortable with. I'm like, will you be guinea pigs? <laughs> Use these tuning forks on you. And then I just started playing with them. And then they were so intriguing and so effective um, that I never stopped. You know, it's been 25 years now that I've Jeez. been, yeah, doing it. 25 years. Uh, I guess it's a slow process, right? Like, you know, feeling someone's energy field. Like, how did you like, so you, you hit the tuning fork, you listen to the sound. And then when you get in certain areas, it just makes a different sound that that areas that need attention. Yeah, basically. I mean, if you think about it, like everything in the body is in motion and everything in motion makes waves and waves propagate. So you can get an EEG, right? And they, they hook up these electrodes to your skull and they can read the frequency of your brain waves, right? So those waves have come out of your brain, they've come through your skull and they don't just stop at your skull, like they keep going. Our brain waves 
emanate out into the electromagnetic environment around us and interact with the waves that are going mm. on out there. Same with our heart actually has much bigger amplitude, right? I mean, have you ever had your heart beat so hard that you think the people in the area can hear it or, you know, feel it? Well, don't you get like this heart variance or heart, uh, not they call it coherence, I guess it is where you like get into your heart's chakra and it starts you know, you feel that vibration and that, uh, you know, that frequency, I'm assuming that projects out right waves of, of energy, correct? I mean, I, don't, I yeah, guess. Yeah, absolutely. Because our heart is, is like the sort of download circuit of our electric body, right? If your heart is beating, there is electric juice pumping through you. You are alive. When your heart stops, and, and then the life, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the heart is pumping really, really our breath is what the heart is pumping more than anything because our heart. So breath, this is really interesting. Like one of the things that I sort of discovered on this journey is how we've been taught to think chemically and mechanically about life and not electrically. And so when I discovered plasma in 2010, coming circling back to that, my son came to the dinner table. I had helped a friend move and, and she had, you know, was going through books and she had a bunch of books on science. And she's like, here, give these to Quinn. I know he likes science. It's Quinn's 12th birthday. And so I gave Quinn a bunch of books on science and he was reading them. <laughs> so he comes to the dinner table and he says, did you know there was a fourth state of matter called plasma? And I was like, <laughs> um solid liquid gas no like <laughs> i missed a whole state of matter how did that happen and then i discovered that it comprised like 99.999 whatever percentage of the universe and i was like what <laughs> how did we how did i not learn about this mm -hmm. and never learn about it and so i started to learn about plasma you know that was back in um 2010 the internet was so wonderful back then <laughs> and uh and I spent four months reading everything I could. In fact, I turned it into an independent study in my master's degree program and, uh, and you know, create a slideshow, did this, learned all about plasma. Yeah. And so what that did was it introduced me to the fact that like, wow, like the solar wind isn't some hot gas blowing us. It's like electrically charged. And when it's really charged and it hits our upper atmosphere, it creates Northern lights. Like that's plasma going from dark current mode to glow mode, like a neon light. <laughs> <laughs> like our whole environment is electrical. I found all these articles like soil bacteria are electric, like everything is electric and alive, including our own bodies. Yeah. And we've just been taught to look in this chemical mechanical lens. And so that's where it is like what you put in your mouth or the surgery that you get or whatever. And missing this whole other element and dimension of ourselves and our reality. And it's the thing that's different about it is it's connected because it's all one light, the same light that powers me and you powers the, the sun and the stars and lightning bugs. And it's all like one connected light and it's biological. It's not spiritual. Sure. No, I, I love all that. I think I'm learning more about the, uh, I guess like, I don't know. I've been learning a little bit about the senses and how, you know, that what parts of the brain fire off, but you know, I'm reading this book, the holographic universe mm -hmm. and which could be a hologram, <laughs> but yeah. uh, the senses, right? Like, are we really feeling the things that we feel like this book that your book that I'm re reading or holding in my hand, electric body, electric health. Is that really the, the senses, my fingertips, or is it just the part of the brain that the, is firing right now because of the electricity that's going on? Right. Like, um, it's just fascinating to me. Um, you know, when you have a thought, electricity is fired off. And then is it when you have a feeling that creates a chemical reaction? Is that how it works? Like uh, electric thought, chemical reaction, emotion, and then it creates a field. Is that how it is? Well, you know, I think there's some debate about on, on that, you know, what you really, where, where does it originate and come from? But sure. I would say our, it's our electric body is responding. Um, and, and that, that and in, you know, if you think of our electric body, like an instrument and, and even like our heart has strings in it. And so our, when we have experiences in life, it's like life plucks our strings and we respond with emotions and these waves go through us and different emotions have different tonal and frequency expressions in the body. And this has been part of mapping the field and learning this language is that 
just like music, like if you and I are listening to a sad song, mm-hmm. I don't need to look at you and go, this is a sad song. Cause you're like, duh, <laughs> of course it's a sad song. Cause we feel it, right? And yeah. so that's the way the tuning forks are. When they're in a part of the biofield that's holding the information of a sad memory, what time when you felt that way, it, we hear it, we feel it, we know it, it evokes it. It's like, this is our primary language is actually this vibrational language that I discovered like all of nature, like animals speak the same vibrational language. Like they know when you're funky, you know, they animals and even plants research has shown that plants sense our vibes and my own research as well. Like I felt fear in a plant. It felt exactly like fear in an animal or fear in a human. Yeah. So there's this very fundamental language of vibration that the body is experiencing emanating. We put words on it. We look at it from the outside, but really it's a vibrational pattern. And so every emotional vibrational pattern that gets generated also creates a chemistry in the body. And uh, Candace Pert, the work of Candace Pert, uh, she wrote a book called Molecules of Emotion and discovered that, you know, in the process of this wave being generated, these molecules are generated. And so what, with any wave, you know, waves want to, they want to rise up, they want to crest, and then they want to fall away. And most of us have been taught that when those waves of emotion start to rise up in us, what do we do? We don't know what to do. So we, we try to push them down. Sure. And most people are filled with an enormous amount of unbroken emotional waves. And that really becomes an impediment in your life. And so electric health is this idea really more than anything of coming to understand the nature of emotions, emotional waves, and like how to, how to surf them, you know, how to like ride the dragon and start to master the experience of, of having a body that, life plucks your strings and what do you do about that like how can you turn that into music and how can you um, navigate a stressful environment while still staying groovy you know Mm. that's how 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 do you do how do you do that right like how do you when life is plucking your strings is it i mean do you go to this type of therapy how do you guide yourself through life, right? Like when your energy is being under attack or you feel like, you know, that um, things could get a little stressful. Well, one is just knowing that everything passes. You know, it's just, it doesn't rain day after day after day after day after day. You know, it's not cold and windy day after day after day. Like everything passes. And I think that that's a kind of a wisdom of age where you come to see, you look back on times when you, things seemed difficult and you were fussing and fussing and then you see how everything worked out and you're like, uh, didn't really need to fuss all that, you know? <laughs> I think that was kind of a waste of energy. Um. <laughs> this therapy is interesting though. Like, could you do uh, a session with where you're at now and myself here? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I will tell you that the, the method of biofield tuning, this practice of using sound, that's using tuning for basically like a comb to groom your body's electronics. To, you know, everything in your system that might be kind of haywire or stuck or, you know, just vibing wrong. It's a way to like get everything smoothed out and in the right rhythm and in the right flows and patterns so that you can optimize your experience as a human instrument right? (laughs) That's what everybody, everybody wants to get into that groove, whether you're an athlete or you're a musician or whatever you want to do, like everybody wants to optimize their functioning. Most of us are going, you know, people are going about in a way chemically trying to eat clean, trying to take the right supplements, being mindful, doing whatever, right? But, but what that whole level of participation doesn't take into account is your emotions and how you feel and how you, monitor and manage your emotional health. It's yeah. more important than anything. And it's something we really don't talk about. We talk about mental health, but we don't really talk so much about emotional health and how important it is to feel, to experience, to talk about, to express how we feel, our emotions. Yeah, well, it's all tied together. They want to look at that dualism, right? The, the mind body as two separate entities when in actuality, it's all tied together, right? Like your emotions oh, and your mindset, right? Like you, you, you know, can't separate it. I mean, even can't. this idea of the biofield, um, the biofield, the, the term biofield was coined in 1994 
by a team of National Institute for Health scientists to come up with a scientific name for what was being called the aura or the human energy field. Sort of this weak electromagnetic field of energy and information that sort of surrounds and interpenetrates the body. I've worked with that definition, but I'm also a practitioner with 25 years of hands on and using sound to actually manipulate the electrical system of the body. And what I've really come to see, you can't separate the electric current that runs through the body that we recognize like, oh yeah, the heart beats and the brain thinks and the everything is running on electrical juice in here from the magnetic field that surrounds it. It's a basic law of physics that anything that has electric current has a magnetic field. And to me, that is just our electrical system in its entirety. They're two sides of the same coin. You can't parse them out from each other. And I found that everything that's going on in the body can also be located in the field and that we can manipulate what's happening in the field, which will then affect what's happening in the body. Another law of physics, magnetic fields guide electric current. So a vibrating tuning fork becomes like a magnet and we can find areas of flow within the electrical body that are like completely off kilter, completely off rhythm and hang out with them, harmonize them, stabilize them and like balance them. And people can have a very dramatic state shift and you can go from like a nine or 10 in pain to like a one or a zero in 20 minutes because your electrical system is doing this. And so when you hook into the electrical system and you resonate with it and you, you know, the body, it's like the snake charmer thing. Like the body <laughs> absolutely responds to sound. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does this, so is this only with pain or is this like emotional stuff too? Is this like just, um, I mean, spirituality, can you apply this to everything or? Yeah, I think it works on every single level because you can't, ultimately you can't separate out any of them when it comes right down to it. Like emotional imbalances are the biggest cause of physical pain. In my observation, you know, many, many thousands of hours, people coming in in pain and me observing and listening deeply and being like, oh, it seems like you're really actually very sad. Like, yeah, your left shoulder hurts, but there's something really sad here. Oh yeah, my partner died 18 months ago and I just can't seem to shake it. And I've gotten an MRI and I've done this, there's nothing wrong with it, but it hurts so much. Meanwhile, there's this heavy cloud because she's been energizing that particular frequency, that particular zone, the mind frame in, in the, you know, your electromagnetic body is your mind. It's your conscious mind, it's your subconscious mind. It holds all of your memories. What do we call it? Our soul. Mm. It's the primary part of us. It is what defines us. Yeah. Well, you said <clears throat> coming on to the interview, I was like, you know, telling you how busy I was and you're like, does your right hip hurt? And I was like, did I tell you that? It's like, no, nah, it just, it hurts. My right side hurts. Yeah. Um, it's pretty cool how you map that out. I mean, that's got to take a lot of time. Yeah. It was a lot of time. It was many, many hours of, of just listening and observing you know i i lived uh, at that time up in the mountains of vermont in the middle of 100 acres in the woods and it was so so quiet and i'd even unplugged the refrigerator in the next room and so i had this just deep silence to work in and listen really really deeply to the pingback and started to observe these patterns and as this anatomy started to come into view i was like how can I be discovering something that nobody else has? Like I you, you can pick it up and move it though, right? You can like yeah, you well, pick it up and you put it back where it's supposed to be. I could definitely pick it up. Yeah. I mean, it was so strange. Like there were, I had these bizarre questions. Like I'd be moving through the field and I'd hit something that felt like it had mass, like it had charge, like it had electromagnetic stickiness to it. And it would, you know, it'd be moving through space with a tuning fork and all of a sudden, douche. Like I was like, whoa, I'm stuck. Like what's going on here? But then I discovered that the tuning fork, yeah, could move it. The tuning fork would become like a magnet and the, the energy would become like iron filings and I, I would be able to move it through the field. And when I would get it to the midline of the body, there would be this feeling like it was like, like sucked into the body in the sense that it had like gone back into circulation. So there's a sort of discovery of like, Oh, there's all this frozen energy in places where there's chaotic sound and they're related to very specific memories, very specific memories. And I, so, so I started to observe like memories from 
that were from uh, gestation or birth were at the outer boundary of the field. And then as I moved in, it was like kind of like dropping a needle on an album and being able to actually read the vibrational record of somebody's life. So, you know, I got to the point where I can go through somebody's field. I can tell you all about your life. I can tell you, you know, you wet your pants at your desk in first grade. <laughs> no, I did. That's a lie. That Don't listen to them. Don't tone. listen to her. I did not. It was, it was kindergarten. <laughs> um, interesting. Very interesting. Um, but yeah, like you said, right. So there's like a six foot, I guess, extension of the field and it goes out and you can start at it. Like what's the outer rim. Is that the most recent or is that the youngest? That's uh, the youngest. That's so the youngest and you work your way yeah. into the. Okay. So it's like a bubble, right. And there's, there's an out, there's a boundary, just like fruit has skin or the earth has the ionosphere, the sun has the heliosphere. The human biofield has a, a, a plasma, a double layer plasma membrane of electric charge that runs mm -hmm. bi-directionally. And that particular zone I found holds information that was generated during, from like conception on. And then just inside, just when you kind of come between that boundary and the rest of the field is the experience of birth. And if somebody had a traumatic birth or if they were stuck for a long, you know, the, all of that information is there. You can, I can feel if somebody had a traumatic birth and I can feel um, if somebody had an easy birth, like, and then I can go on to feel what their first three years of life felt like. And I can reflect this. And then this is the stuff that's precognitive that is yeah. so formative and that we can we can't access in other ways but this is a way to actually read that record and reflect it back to the organizing intelligence of the body along with the current consciousness of the body and the body does an amazing thing it will take that feedback of noise and it will it will harmonize it it will it will tune it to bring it into hmm. a greater harmony so that, that makes me think, so can we use like, <clears throat> you ever use binaural beats for anything? Like, do you ever use that type of sound to, to outside of tuning forks to heal the body? Can you do that? Well, I've created binaural beats with the tuning forks that I use. So I have a set of tuning forks that creates a binaural beat of 7.83 Hertz, which is the, the fundamental of the Schumann resonance, the earth's resonant sort of bottom line electromagnetic frequency. Um, so we can do that. I created a binaural beat of 111 Hertz between 528 and 417. And 111 Hertz is in a lot of chambers as the resonant frequency. So we can create a binaural beat that way. I also have a pair of Fibonacci forks, um, a pair of forks that are the 11th and 12th position of the Fibonacci sequence, 89 Hertz and 144 Hertz. And so when you listen to either one of those, you're actually creating the golden mean, the golden spiral as a um as a binaural kind of experience golden spiral so what is that the fibonacci um well it's related to phi so a lot of people know pi 3.14 blah, yeah. blah 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 lesser known as phi which is 1.618 uh so if you you take a, a like a rectangle like that is business card size is like called a golden mean rectangle it's the most visually pleasing or harmonically balanced kind of rectangle shape and um, but there's a lot more to it than that but basically what this particular ratio in mathematics and nature relates to like order beauty harmony sacred geometry you know that the sort of underlying geometry that expresses itself in nature and the ratios of that so that's you hear that vibration right those hertz and I know with binaural beats, right? Like that is supposed to, uh, I guess, hemisync, right? I call it hemisync, um, synchronization of the brain hemispheres. Is that the same type of concept with that? Yeah, it's the same con concept. It's just that we're using acoustic frequencies instead of digital frequencies. Sure. And, you know, for me, because I've been using acoustic instrument for 25 years, like I'm really analog and really acoustically oriented. I'm not inclined to put on headphones and like listen to digitally created sound because it's missing overtones. And my ear has been really conditioned to listen to subtleties and overtones and undertones. And you really lose that in the way that media is currently delivered in these really compressed files. 
No, I'm not saying that there isn't value in that delivery. Sure. I'm just kind of like, if you have any friends who like would rather listen to vinyl than CDs, like I kind of fall in that. I'd rather pattern. go to a concert than uh, listen mm -hmm. to a CD. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that, that, I don't know that translates the same thing. I get what you're saying. Um, um, I guess when you're in that synchronization of the hemisphere of the two hemispheres of the brain, what are you experiencing? What is your subjective experience with that? Well, I'm not sure, you know, is it, is it synchronization of hemispheres certainly I think plays a role, but also like where your brain waves are at. So a lot of people, like most people, what I find tend to bounce around in what is called, um, uh, oh dear, beta. Beta, which, yeah, beta, alpha, yeah. beta, delta. Yeah, exactly. So it, they're sort of bouncing around in, in the monkey mind, in, in conscious <laughs> thought. Monkey mind. Yeah, where the mind, the brain just goes. There's always like, you know, diarrhea mouth going on in there, sure. words, 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 words. And a lot of it's just like garbage words, you know? And a lot of people have an inner critic and an inner victim and they're doing attack and defense and there's a lot of inner division and and just noise going on, right? And, and so what I've found is that when you go into a state of listening, whether you're listening to music, whether you're listening to hemisphere synchronization, you've gone out of beta and into alpha. And that is just a quieter place. That's like being yeah. outside listening to the birds and not really thinking. Well, I guess I'm trying to politely ask, what have you experienced in that in those states, like alpha? Like, so uh, you know, people that listen to the show know that I'm a big Robert Monroe, uh, Bob Monroe fan, and he would use it to achieve out-of-body experiences. Okay. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Thomas Campbell, who, is a, who was a student of Bob Monroe, and he uses hemisync binaural beats to produce, try to produce these states. And it's not something, you know, you don't listen to it once and you have them. It's like something that you produce over time, like you got to actually put in the work. And so like, you know, you being uh, a person that is very dedicated to this, this, um, this craft, I mean, you gotta, you gotta experience some pretty gnarly stuff. Well, all kinds. I mean, the full spectrum, I, you know, because I'm able to read people's minds. I'm able to read their vibes and, you know, you see people walking in the street. Hold on, you can read people's minds. Walk into the, my office and you're like, Hey, you're pretty cool. And then you get in their field and you're like, Oh my God, I can't believe this unspeakable trauma that you've experienced. Like everybody, most everybody, at least the kind of people who go looking for help, it's just astonishing some of the difficulties that human beings go through and that they still show up and they smile and they function, they're polite. And, you know, everybody has a story there, right? So I've been exposed to, to really all kinds of like incredibly disturbing vibes. But at the same time, I've also been exposed to like incredibly illuminated, angelic, you know, elevated moments with special people in, in you know, incredible expanded states, shamanic kinds of uh, expanded realities. Um, I've perceived all kinds of things. I used to see things like, um, nooses around people's necks and shackles around ankles and like while, while you were doing doing the, your therapy like while you would I see was this doing sessions yeah i used to see them but then i decided i didn't want to see things like that and so I you would see things on people like that that's not yeah that's yeah pretty. i would i would definitely see things like that and i would be able to remove them and people would have an experience of a profound state shift so do you think that's from like past lives or from their current life i think the more likely explanation is that it's genetic. Genetic, that's interesting. It's some kind of perhaps genetic imprint in the DNA, but it could also be, you know, if you think what I was saying about how your electric body is you, it's your light, you're alive. And when you die, your light goes out. Well, where does it go? Does it remain differentiated or still holding all of these patterns? Is this our karma? And then are we resonantly attracted to some kind of situation that resonates with what we already have in our fields in order to continue the soul's journey through time? Or when a, when a unit dies, does the light just undifferentiate and return back to the one, you know, to pop out somewhere else? So mm -hmm. 
I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. I don't either. But I, I watch, uh, just watched a couple of uh, series on Netflix, Sur- Surviving Death. And I, I like to think, you know, I'm a big fan of near death experiences and uh, the work they're doing at University of Virginia. I like to think that we, we, we you know, we, we return to the one, you know, and, and that we, or, or we keep coming back for just different experiences, working with karma and, and reliving and gaining um, more awareness and higher consciousness. Like I would love for that to be the case. Um, you know, expanding our, you know, or just working with the, I don't know, working with the energy really, you know, like understanding that more, helping humanity evolve a little bit more and get out of that, uh, uh, I guess that, uh, I don't know, uh, that materialistic idea, right. Um, you know, help science a little bit more along the way, get out outside of this objective, uh, philosophy, you know, be- right. Which is really goes against like what I was saying earlier about the early quantum, uh, explorers really saw very clearly how the observer affects the observed. And so there is no objective science. You know, everything is viewed through the lens of our own subjectivity and our own perception and expectation affects the outcome because we're all creators. So that part of quantum physics was kind of obscured from from us really knowing and we're supposed to listen to science as some kind of objective thing, but that kind of objectivity is impossible. It just is. It is. You're exactly right. Like in psychology, it's impossible. I mean, it's not impossible, but I mean, it's like, it's more about the experience of the the viewer, which Mm -hmm. is very subjective. Um, You have a tight, I guess a subtitle in here, hacking bliss, which really caught my eye. Um, Can you talk about that? Kind of what I was thinking about when you asked me about your friends who have these out of body experiences, like I'm not interested in having out of body experiences. I'm interested in having in body experiences. I'm interested in occupying my body and the more that, you know, our culture really drives us out of our body, especially um, women. Like if we're not skinny and we don't have a flat stomach and we don't, you know, we, we're like, we, we, we go into self-loathing and most women go through and probably men too. I can't speak for men, but there's a kind of terrible self-loathing that uh, from spiritual, like, oh, I'm just going to be in my higher chakras, you know, and like everything that's sort of guilt and shame and everything about our body, our bodies are built for pleasure. You know, I love Stuart Hameroff. He advances this idea that like life adv- life evolved in pursuit of pleasure. Hmm. I was doing this session, uh, synchronizing the four quadrants of the heart. And um, with my tuning forks, I go in and I explore different parts of the anatomy and I listen to them and I find the noise and I tune and I do this, I record them and people listen to them. And so this particular one was listening really deeply to the heart. And I became so aware of how the heart is so connected to like, uh, the lower part of the heart to like our sexuality, to our groin, to our reproductiveness, and then and to the throat and the mouth. You know, these are areas of such potential pleasure. Like, why else would you know? Like, we think about sure. it. Like, life is designed to like move away from pain and move towards pleasure. So the, everybody's trying to like ascend to five D and raise their vibration and have out of body experiences when like actually really connecting to your electric body, really getting wired in and into the, the pleasure potential, the bliss potential of having a body. Like this is the cool part of being here is our bodies are so amazing. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. most of us live outside of them or in some kind of wrong relationship with them. So I'm like, what I, I call a moderate hedonist. Like I like all the mm-hmm. things. You know? Like I want to enjoy all the good stuff in life. And that's, don't tell me that's not spiritual because what is bliss? You know, you can't sit in meditation, enjoying your relationship with the one when you, your belly hurts or you know, you're not comfortable yeah. and you're full up of emotions that you're trying to stuff so you can raise your vibe. Yeah, no, I agree with you hundred percent. I will. It's a lot of little, it's a little bit of an escapism, right? Like when you try to, you try to look at it, like we're always trying to, I mean, we're just trying to escape the pain, right? Like we always want to be happy, blissful, you know, we'd never want to feel pain. 
but uh, that was me uh not too long ago like i was just like trying to get these states of uh bliss or states of higher consciousness so i couldn't i wouldn't feel the humanity side of myself and you know and and i really be- became lucky recently and stumbled upon uh ram das's teachings and you know he talks about freedom from you know not not freedom from the self but like you know if you're gonna be a human why not take the curriculum right like be here but be with an open heart and and learn how to you know he, he says live in hell with an open heart and be able to experience everything there is to be human but not you know you it's okay to feel sadness it's okay to feel happiness but know that it's not you not who you truly are and uh, live in it and experience it and take it for what it is. But you know, that that's for you, for you to work out your karma to work out. And it's like, you know, a lot of people, like I was a part of that too, where I'm trying to escape all the, all the negative stuff. And yeah. I don't know. I just think, it's, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's it. I mean, and, and what I really figured out, you know, and all that trying to escape that negative stuff, it just piles up in your field as in, as inflammation and stuff that it's, it's not like it's not being generated. It's not like you're not feeling angry or feeling sad i mean people are sometimes surprised to hear like i cry almost every day you know just for a minute or two like something sad comes to my radar i'm like oh my god that's so sad sure. and I'll cry, but i also will laugh really easily or you know what i mean like we've been so programmed to be afraid of our feelings and not feel our feelings we're constantly in this state of resistance and trying to push them away instead of just going wow yeah life is plucking that string and i'm feeling that way and i'm and it's going to move through me and it's going to break and it's going to pass yeah. You know, I also kick a heavy bag at the gym in the morning. <laughs> I think that it's really important that we allow our body to express all the things, you know, sometimes we all, we all get angry. We all get irritable. We all get tired. We all get sad. We all get despairing. Like every, we feel all the feels and it's okay to feel them. If you start judging and labeling some is good and some is bad, you're requesting this then you're really stopping the spontaneous experience of joy, which is like the very ground state of our being is actually one of like this illuminated joyfulness that wants to sing like a bird at sunrise. Like that's our nature. And we've all become so burdened down with noise and story and suffering and ancestral, you know, we're just so full of static. But when you clear that static, everybody has this beautiful clear signal underneath. Like Mm. everybody. That's pretty beautiful. Yeah, I like that. Eileen, this has been uh, amazing. How can people connect with you? How can they find your book? Well, the book uh, Electric Body, Electric Health is on, it's basically everywhere. So you can, any, whatever, if you have a local bookstore you want to get it from, or you can get it on Amazon, um, Barnes and Noble. And uh, so that's there. My other book, my first book, Tuning the Human Biofield, you can also find that. And, uh, and they're on Audible. So I've narrated the, the book. So if you prefer to listen to books, you can get it at Audible and also on Kindle. Listen to her lovely voice. That'd be exciting. I would love to do that. Um, this I love this book. I read it, made some notes in it. I'm going to try to use it for, I'm going to use it for my day, you know, some of my uh, areas of my life that I need to tune into a little bit more. Um, definitely my right side. It's some great great stuff in here i highly suggest everyone go get it um uh, going back to circling around that, that one question though right so you practice in vermont you have you know i guess your 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 clientele are up there but you also said that you can do this like if how do you do it if i'm here and you're there like you're in vermont i'm in baltimore how does that work well first of all people asked me for years if i could do this at a distance and i was like no, <laughs> I thought it was the stupidest question. I was like, I'm using sound waves on the body. There is no way that this would work at a distance. Like, it just seemed so dumb and I was so arrogant about it. And then I actually um, got to know this fellow by the name of Dr. Carl Merritt who wrote the preface to the foreword to Tuning the Human Biofield. He's an MD who has a, a practice in California. And he persuaded me to try a distance session on him. And, you know, I, one of my favorite things I was one of saying like, let's try this and see what happens. Like I really, I'm a, I'm a scientist. I love experiments. And even though 
I thought it was preposterous. I was like down for the experiment. So what I did was I pretended that he was on my treatment table. I approached an empty treatment table as if he was there. And at this point, you know, this was back in 2011, I think maybe 2012. Mm -hmm. um, I could go through somebody's field and I could tell them their whole life story. I could tell them personality, their mom, like just everything, you know, inflammation here. Um, this organ isn't right, arthritis in this joint, because it's all a tonal language, right? Remember everything in the body is making waves and these waves have a particular sound that they make and I've just kind of decoded it all. It's kind of like teaching myself a kind of braille almost, like sonic braille. Um, so what I did was we did not have an open line of communication. I just intended and, and I, I, much to my amazement, the same field of information, the pattern and field showed up and I went through it and I read it just as if there was somebody on the table and I took notes. And then when I was all done, I got on the phone with him and I went through my notes and I'm like, you were this age and that and this and that and this organ and da, 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 da. And he's like, that's all exactly right. Mm. And he said, and I, I, he did like a resting blood sugar or something before and after, but he said, he also felt me work on him and he felt very different afterwards. And I was like, wow. get out of town. Like, oh my God, like all the, I've been so like dismissive of this and all. And here's the thing. I went into it, not even believing that I could do it and astonished myself that I could. Right. And so then I went on to teach other people how to do it. And at this point, we've trained thousands of people how to do this. And they all have the same experience that I did. They approach the table, they find the information, they share the information, and they're correct. They're able to read and modulate the person's field from a distance. I don't even need a picture of somebody. All I need to know is their name and how old they are. And I can scan and it's like pulling a book off a library shelf and reading it. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Trey Downs, 37 years old. Um, just let me know what, what you find there. <laughs> um, this has been awesome. Uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Uh, last question, um, kind of important. What do you want your legacy to be? Oh, Trey, I don't think anybody's ever asked me that. It's an interesting question. Um, well, honestly, I feel like I, you know, knock on wood, if I were to die tomorrow, I feel like I kind of already have done it. I mean, I, you know, I've definitely um, discovered this whole new territory that was hidden in plain view and developed this sort of elegant backdoor hack into our minds to help us to be, it's like shortcuts help, you know, a lot <laughs> and, and really opens up a whole new frontier of exploration. And, you know, I'm doing peer reviewed, grant funded peer reviewed science in the biofield, kind of taking this this realm that has been, you know, oh, what's the energy and energy medicine? Oh, that's all woo. You know I mean? Like, yeah. hey, it's electricity. <laughs> like, what's everybody fussing about? Like electric current magnetic field. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the energy and energy medicine. And let's stop dismissing it as alternative and really seek to understand it and work with it and just keep people healthy. You know, people ask me, do you work with people with cancer? Do you work with people who are really ill? I'm like, no, I really don't. I want to work with healthy people, <laughs> people with mild to moderate stuff and, and help you to get well and help you to stay well by understanding how important your electrical system is and just taking care of that. And, and that, you know, that makes life and health just a lot easier and, and even more fun. Because mm -hmm. because getting electrically healthy is all the fun things, you know, <laughs> like singing and dancing and having sex and you know, it's oh yep, good there you stuff. Go. <laughs> that is awesome, Eileen. Thank you so much for joining the show. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much. I'm I, it's truly an honor to have you here. Thanks, Trey. It's been a pleasure.